So yesterday, we began to tell the story, the parable of Grandmother Ford. A sad story about a grandmother who was deeply grieved and took unfortunate action. She was grieved because her eight-year-old granddaughter died suddenly, tragically, clearly. This was just devastating for the whole family. Her daughter, the mother of her granddaughter, was, was absolutely distraught. The favorite hymn of this little girl had been, I Come to the Garden Alone, page 77 in the hymnal. Every time the, that, that hymn was sung, it caused so much emotional eruption in the family that it became overwhelming. And so one night, out of compassion, really out of desire to alleviate pain in her family, Grandmother Ford took action. She went to the church and she ripped out page 77 and page 78, because it was on the other side, that both of those hymns ripped them out once and for all so that hymn would never be sung in that church again and so that her family would not have to experience such deep hurt ever again. Now, since Jesus used parables to provoke thought and to draw out applications, people might, that people might other, uh, not otherwise be willing to hear. Yesterday, I shared the parable and just asked you to think, what are the biblical principles that you hear? What are the biblical principles that you hear being violated by Mrs. Ford? What lessons can we learn? Well, let me share with you a few. A couple that Bob Russell makes, and the parable was written originally by, by, by Bob, and um, a couple that I would share. The first one, application that Bob makes is, impulsive emotional responses, even though motivated by love, can be erroneous, erroneous and destructive. Impulsive emotional rea rea responses, even though motivated by love, can still be destructive. Consider these scriptures for wisdom. Proverbs 16, 32. Patience is better than power. Controlling one's emotions better than capturing a city. Proverbs 14, 29. A patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered person promotes foolishness. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but the wise person holds it in check. No matter what the motivation for the impatience or the anger, it may ultimately be a very loving motivation like Grandmother Ford had, but it's, even though it's motivated by, by love, it can still be wrong and destructive. I don't know about you, but I can relate to Grandmother Ford. I am sure she is a fine person, was a fine person. I am sure by the grace of Jesus Christ, because of her love for Christ, her surrender to Christ, because Jesus saved her, that someday we will meet her in paradise. However, we would also say that this moment was not a highlight of her life spiritually. And some of us can relate well, there are many of us who are saved, but we look back and we think, man, I was, had good motives, but I did such a foolish thing. And it caused so much more pain than necessary. What was the result of her venting of her anger? Bob Russell writes, damaged property, prolonged grief, stirring up gossip, and actually, it brought dishonor to her granddaughter's memory, the very thing she wouldn't want to do. Proverbs 29, again, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. Just because you have loving motives does not make it wise or productive to vent your actions. Impulsive emotional responses, even though motivated by love, can still be destructive. 
second thing logically follows. The second lesson is this. No matter how deep the pain, no hurt justifies sin. Sometimes we're hearing that a lot today. People justifying doing the wrong thing, or what the Bible would say would be a, the wrong thing, an unloving thing, but they justify it because they're so filled with hurt. Jesus sets us the example again for this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. You were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. What's the example we should follow? He did not commit sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who, just, who judges justly. Who has ever suffered more pain than Jesus? Who had been more justified than anybody else to lash out sinfully because he was experiencing so much unjust pain? Jesus was beaten and stripped naked, nailed to a cross, humiliated for all the world to see. Again, he was being punished completely unjust. Nobody has ever been treated more unjustly. Jesus lived a perfect life, and yet he was being punished for others' sins. He was suffering because he had moved from the place, the richest estate in all eternity, to the womb of a poor unwed mother. And all he came, the only reason he came was to show his love to people. All he did was to live a life of perfect love for other people. And he lived as a, an oppressed minority under the Roman Empire. And after three and a half years of ministry, everybody abandoned him. If anybody ever had justification to rationalize acting out because he'd been hurt, because of his pain, it was Jesus. But the Bible says he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He suffered for you, Peter says. He did not commit sin. Even though he was insulted, even when he suffered, he did not threaten in return. No one's pain ever justifies sin. Don't let your pain determine your morality. We live in a world right now that people let their pain determine their morality. Yeah, normally it's wrong, but I've experienced so much pain. Well, if you knew what I was going through, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but if you'd known how much I'd suffered, if you, if you knew how much I had to put up with, yeah, I know it's wrong, but you really don't know what's been done to me. I know what the Bible says, but... I know I shouldn't do that on Facebook. I know I shouldn't have, uh, yeah, I should know I should forgive, but if you've been hurt as deeply as I, Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sins. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. That is the third application, and that is when we experience great pain, we have to get great perspective. How did Jesus endure the pain? He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He got perspective on life. When hurt, get perspective. Have you ever noticed how relative pain is? You know, some men and women have fought in war and they have taken uh, um, enemy fire. You know, they've had bullets rattling their body, and yet they continue to fight on. They continue to rescue their buddies, those they love. Me, on the other hand, you know, I cut my, I cut my nail just a little bit too close to the cuticle. You know how irritating that could be? And it can irritate me the rest of the day. It's like overwhelming. I got to take a week's vacation because, you know, pain is so often relative to your perspective on what really matters at the time. Grandma Ford, Gra Grandmother Ford seemed to lose perspective, sadly, didn't she? How different might her actions have been if rather than impulsively trying to come to the rescue, 
she had learned to entrust herself to the one who judges justly, she would have somehow learned how to lead her family to, f to find the healer who heals all wounds. Hey, the death of a child is a horrible thing. But what does it mean that if we are in Christ, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope? How different it makes things when we realize life is temporary. I mean, this world is going to be over like that, but eternity lasts forever, never ends. How different would it make if, we, if she would have just said, I, I wonder what actions are going to be wisest in 70 years from now. I wonder what will bring God honor today and in 100 years from now. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 says, Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. Furthermore, we had fathers, human fathers, discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of our spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Worldly perspective says there is an eternity to look forward to. The pain that we're experiencing now will pass away, but God is faithful and God is up to something. God can redeem this right now. I mean, how many of you have taken a child to the doctor, a, a, a toddler, and you know that toddler is going to get a, 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 a shot, and that toddler does not want to get a shot. And the toddler cries and looks at you like you've betrayed them for allowing the doctor to hurt them like that. But as a parent, why, what are you thinking? You know what's best for that child. You know that that short-term pain for that child is ultimately going to work for her better her health, her strength. If we can understand that in our limited human wisdom, if we can understand that about our children, don't we think an eternal Heavenly Father knows that even better when He allows us to go through grief? We grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We need perspective. As David would write, weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. One final lesson that Bob Russell applies. He said, it would have been so much better if a good friend in the church had interrupted Grandmother Ford on the eve of her ill-advised mission, put an arm around her and said, honey, we grieve with you. We hurt for you. But tearing out a page in the hymnal will not solve the problem. Let's pray together so we can cast our cares on the Lord because He promises that He will sustain you. He will never leave the righteous. Let the righteous be shaken. That's Psalm 55, 22. Sadly, apparently nobody did. If they lacked the opportunity or the courage to confront Grandmother Ford, as a result, decades later, Scars remain. Seventy years have passed since Grandma Four gave full vent to her pain. And yet, before Bob published this blog, he sent it to me because he said, Brett, you're closer to the Meadville Church now than I am. Do you think there are still people at the church who might be hurt if I shared this story? Do you think it might dredge up unnecessary pain? Seventy years have passed, and yet the legacy of genuine grief vented foolishly continues to cast a shadow over people. As Jesus would say often when sharing his parables, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your wisdom. 
and pray that you would transform us into the image of Christ, not be conformed to this world, which so often and easily rationalizes, if it feels good, it must be good. Give us your perspective. Remind us of your grace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Hey, if I'm speaking to anybody today who's grieving and you need somebody to pray for you or pray with you, would please get in touch with us at New Life. Certainly you could call the office at 703-222-8836 or you could email us at the office. Um, uh, we'd love to help you and pray for you however we can. If you found this helpful, I hope you share it with a friend. And until we talk to you again, let's pray for each other.